Well, for the last few weeks, we have been studying one of the most unique and one of the most misunderstood books in the Bible. At one point, it almost looked like the Song of Solomon might even be excluded from the canon of Holy Scripture because of its frank descriptions of intimacy and sexual love. But the Jewish people have always revered this little book, and they still read it every single year during their feast of Passover because they understand it to be an allegory of the love between Jehovah and Israel. And Christians in the New Testament, on the other side of Calvary, we understand it on an even deeper level to be an allegory of the love that exists between Jesus Christ and his church. Now, I know we've jumped back and forth through this book quite a bit in our study, and I know sometimes that's confusing when we're used to going uh, kind of verse by verse in an expository fashion. So I thought it would help if I drew you a map of the book of Song of Solomon, just so you could understand it more clearly. This book is Ancient Eastern Poetry. It flows back and forth and back and forth between various speakers and it shifts seamlessly from one scene to another scene. And there really isn't much of a definite storyline. And the joke really is that if you drew a map of Song of Solomon, it probably would look a lot like that. But despite that loose structure, most scholars have come to a general agreement on this outline. And I've kind of rehearsed this every week because... If you read this book, as you read this book, I want you to kind of know where you are. There are three sections, and the first one describes the bride and the bridegroom in their engagement. Then it moves to their wedding, and then finally to their marriage. There's a lot of jumping back and forth, uh, remembrances and uh, dreams for the future. And so it's not chronological, but those are three rough sections. And they're separated by two haunting dreams that the bride has when she fears for a few moments that her bridegroom has been taken from her, that he has left her. And then finally, uh, after their marriage, she's happy and the book ends and everything's good. So taken as a whole, this book is a beautiful portrait of marriage where we leave our family of origin, where we cleave to one another as husband and wife, and then finally we weave a new relationship together for the rest of our lives. And it's a, a beautiful picture of the relationship between us and Jesus. Now tonight, we want to weave the threads of this beautiful tapestry together. We want to review our scriptural journey thus far. And in doing so, we want to combine a few of the book's historical and geographical statements we want to contrast the perspectives of the bride and the groom one more time. And then, most importantly tonight, we want to look through the lens of the rest of Scripture to see the relationship between Jesus and his church. By the time we finish tonight and we put all the pieces of this puzzle together, I think you will know firmly, forever, and exactly why God allowed this little song of songs to be included in the Bible. Now, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. There are thousands of variants on the folktale Cinderella, and they are known and loved throughout the world. And in all those tales, whatever the language, whatever the culture, the protagonist is always a young woman who is living in forsaken circumstances. But her circumstances are suddenly changed to remarkable fortune, all because she ascends to the throne by marriage. Although the story's title sometimes changes and the main character's name certainly changes in different languages, in our English culture, in our English language, Cinderella has come to mean one whose beauty and attributes were previously unrecognized. But now that one suddenly and unexpectedly achieves recognition or success after a long period of obscurity and neglect. I mentioned this a couple of, of weeks ago. I didn't know this. In secular literature, the earliest variant of the Cinderella story was recounted by the Greek philosopher Strabo. 
during the lifetime of Jesus. So Cinderella is 2,000 years old. He told of a Greek slave girl named Rhodopis who eventually married the king of Egypt. But nearly 1,000 years before the Greek philosopher Strabo ever told his fictional story about Rhodopis, there was a real-life Cinderella who first caught the attention of the king of Israel. And as we've studied, that king, of course, is Solomon. He is the wisest and the wealthiest man who ever lived. He presided over the golden age of Israel when the entire nation lived in peace and prosperity. When the glorious temple and the royal palace were both constructed, and when people from distant lands traveled to Israel just to hear Solomon's wisdom and just to see his wealth for themselves. Solomon is a builder extraordinaire. He is the chief architect and the chief engineering genius behind hundreds of construction projects throughout the whole nation. He writes later in Ecclesiastes, I made me great works. I builded me houses, I planted me vineyards, I made me gardens and orchards, and I planted trees in them of all kinds of fruits. I made me pools of water to water therewith the wood that bringeth forth trees. And one of those magnificent estates owned by Solomon was a vast vineyard in the fertile Jezreel Valley of northern Israel. It was near a tiny village called Shunem, about 50 miles from the capital of Jerusalem. And it was here that the king's subjects performed the arduous, back-breaking work of tending the crops, pruning the vines, picking the grapes, warding off thieves and predators, enduring the hot, burning sun day after day after endless day, and then giving the proceeds to the royal treasury. The Bible records in the last chapter of this little book, that Solomon had a vineyard at Baal Haman. He let out the vineyard unto keepers. Every one for the fruit thereof was to bring a thousand pieces of silver. Later in the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon tells us something about himself. It's perhaps unusual for a king, but he did this. He tells us in Ecclesiastes that he often undertook expeditions to discover what life was like in various levels of society. Or he took trips to check on his vast land holdings. Now, one day, years before he wrote Ecclesiastes, Solomon just happened to be traveling north to Baal Haman to check on his estates. And as he entered the vast vineyard in the fertile Jezreel Valley, his eyes just happened to fall on a strikingly beautiful peasant girl who just happened to be working in the king's vineyard. And in the heart of King Solomon, it was love at first sight. But now the king has a dilemma because he and his true love, they move in completely different orbits and they inhabit totally different worlds. Their random meeting was certainly improbable, but to take it any further, their courtship is inconceivable and a marriage between a peasant and the king, that's absolutely unimaginable. Solomon has all the power in Israel, but in matters of the heart, the king is absolutely powerless. You know why? Because you can't buy love. And even if you could, who would want love if you had to buy it? That's what the Shulamite records in the closing moments of this beautiful poem, many waters cannot quench love, neither can the floods drown it. If a man would give all the substance of his house for love, it would utterly be condemned. It wouldn't work. It wouldn't be real love because you can't buy love. 175 years ago, there was a Danish philosopher named Soren Kierkegaard. And he wrote a book called Philosophical Fragments. And based on his love for the Song of Solomon, 
Kierkegaard, in that book, penned a short story. They sometimes read it at Christmas. It's called The King and the Maiden. And tonight, I'd like to take a couple of moments and just read you a modern English adaptation. Suppose there was a king who loved a humble maiden. She had no royal pedigree, no education, no standing in the king's court. She dressed in rags and slept in a hovel. She lived the pitiful life of a peasant. But for reasons no one could quite figure out, the king fell in love with this girl in the way that kings sometimes do. Why he should love her was beyond explaining. But love her he did, and he could not stop loving her. But there arose in the heart of the king an anxious thought. How in the world can I reveal my love to this girl? How can I bridge the great chasm that separates the two of us? His advisors, of course, told him it was simple. All he had to do was command her to be his queen, and it would be done. For this king was a man of immense power. Every statesman feared his wrath. Every foreign power trembled before him, and every subject groveled in the dust at the king's voice. This poor peasant girl would have no power to resist. She would have to become the queen. But power, even unlimited power, cannot command love. The king could force her body to be present in the palace, but he could not force love to be present in her heart. He might be able to gain her obedience this way, but... Coerced submission is not what he wanted. He longed for intimacy of heart and oneness of spirit. But you see, all the power in the world cannot unlock the human heart. It must be opened from inside. So the king met with his advisors once again. This time they said, we've got a new idea, your majesty. Try and bridge the chasm by elevating her to your position. You can shower her with gifts and dress her in royal robes and summon an audience of dignitaries and then just in front of everybody, have her crowned queen. But the king thought it over and realized if he brought her to his palace, if she saw all the wealth, pomp, and power of his greatness the king knew that she would be simply overwhelmed. How then would he ever know if she loved him for himself or merely for all the things he had given to her? And how could she know for sure that, she really, that he really loved her? That he would have loved her just as much if she didn't live in a palace, if she didn't wear royal robes or a crown. How could she know for sure that he would really love her just as much if he had remained, if she had remained only a humble peasant? How could they know? How could he know for sure? How could she know for sure? It was a conundrum and a dilemma. Every alternative his advisor suggested came up empty. And finally, the king realized there was only one way to win the maiden's love without destroying her freedom to choose. He had to become like her, without power or riches or even the title of king, because only then would she be able to see him for who he really was and not just what he possessed. So one day... The king arose from his throne, took off his crown, relinquished his scepter, and laid aside his royal robes. He dressed himself in rags, left the palace, and traveled all the way to where she lived, all so he could win her heart. Yes, the king took on the identity of a poor pauper, all for love. It's a beautiful story. 
And so it was that Solomon returned to the vast vineyard he owned near the tiny village of Shunem. But no one would have recognized him as the owner of that vast estate this time. Because he didn't look like King Solomon anymore. Solomon had disguised himself in the garments of a humble shepherd. He did this just to see if a real relationship between them could ever be possible. But the Shulamite girl, she spent a lifetime apologizing for her poverty and her appearance. And she just can't help herself. It's a habit. It's a, a mentality. She can't comprehend that anyone could ever love her, even if he is just a humble shepherd. She is totally embarrassed by her grubby face and her grimy hands and her tangled hair and her threadbare clothes and her tattered appearance. But none of this is her fault. She is sunburned from working outside all the time. She says, I am black. I am burned from the rays of the sun. Hard work has made her garments shabby and dirty and she's scratched and sticky from picking grapes. She says, my own vineyard. Have I not kept? And worst of all, her stepbrothers and stepsisters, they have treated her harshly. She says, my mother's children, they're not my siblings, but they're my mother's children and they were angry with me. They forced her to endure the long, difficult days in the vineyard that have now over the years marred her beauty and damaged her dignity. So she says, don't look on me. I'm not worthy of love. Even if you are just a humble shepherd, I'm not worthy of anybody caring for me. But this handsome shepherd sees what nobody else seems to see. He looks beyond her battered appearance and her tattered past to see a beautiful bride. When she puts herself down, he picks her back up. When she has nothing but words of despair, he responds with expressions of love. She sees herself as a Cinderella, but he sees her as the queen of his kingdom. He says, oh, thou art all fair, my love. There is no spot in thee. Everything I see about you is beautiful, even the scars. Everything I see about you it's beautiful, even the past. Because what she doesn't realize is that where the word of a king is, there is power. And if she has a relationship with King Solomon, her past is going to be transformed into a testimony of his power and his goodness and his gifts. It's an amazing story, but she can't see it yet. Oh, but he can see it. Can you fathom that when Jesus looks at his church, he says about us, thou art all fair, my love. There is no spot in thee. Now that boggles our brain because we just have to look in the mirror in the morning and we see bodies that are aging and we see uh, wrinkles under our eyes from sleepless nights and, and, and we can remember conversations and events. We can remember failures. We are burdened down with our faults and if you want to talk about spots, we can name them all. There's a spot last March. There's a spot five years ago. There's a disaster, a death decade back we can name all the spots but can you fathom that when the king of all kings looks at his redeemed church he says thou art all fair my love there is no spot in thee that's called mercy that's called grace. That's called the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanseth us from all sin. That's what that's called. I wish you'd take just a moment in the middle of Bible study and thank him for a love that looks at you and declares you faultless, spotless, 
perfect before him. You don't have to sit with your head hung down tonight. You can stand free in the presence of God because the king of all the ages is madly in love with you. The king of all kings and the Lord of all lords. He's invested in your life. <laughs> Oh, I know in your sight it's a mess. I know in your sight it's painful memories. But in his sight, because of the blood, he sees no spot in you. When he sees you, he only sees the blood of the lamb. He sees you as worthy and not the sum of who you are or what you've done. Ah, that's a privilege. That's a privilege. Hmm. <laughs> We don't know how long their court, courtship lasted. But because two spring seasons are referred to in Song of Solomon in chapter 2 and in chapter 7, it seems that Solomon must have visited Bel Haman repeatedly at least over several months. And during that time, a friendship grew into affection, grew into romance, grew into love. His plan worked. Because now it was the Shulamites' turn to fall head over heels in love. But there's a funny part in the book here. She never could quite figure out why her handsome shepherd never ever seemed to have any sheep in his vicinity. She says, tell me, O thou whom my soul lovest, where thou feedest and where you make your flock to rest at noon. Why should I be as one that turneth aside by the flocks of thy companions? Everybody else has got sheep. All the other shepherds have big flocks of sheep. Where are your sheep? And he just keeps evading the question for months. Eventually, his royal responsibilities call him back to the palace in Jerusalem. But not before Solomon promises the Shulamite, I will return and I will make you my bride. She still has no idea that he is the king. He was gone a long time. Sometimes she dreamed of him. Always she longed for him. Constantly her thoughts wandered to the wedding that he had promised. But nothing happened. For days, for weeks, then for months. Other than her love for him, everybody looking at her knew that nothing had changed in her everyday life. You see, she still had to toil in the vineyard, tend the crops, prune the vines, pick the grapes, carry those heavy bushels, Ward off thieves and predators and every day she was right back out there toiling in the hot burning sun day after day after endless day. And now, in addition to her regular responsibilities, she also had to endure the harsh mockery of her family and her friends who simply didn't believe that a humble shepherd with these big promises would ever return and make her his bride. And so they mock her. Whither is thy beloved gone, O thou fairest among women? Whither is thy beloved turned aside that we may seek him with thee? They're mocking her. Your shepherd isn't coming back. Your shepherd isn't going to make you his bride. You're worthless. You're a failure. You're a pauper and a peasant. It's not going to happen. And she has to answer the mockery time after time. Sometimes she replies with calm assurance. But other times she battles nagging doubts. Sometimes she speaks with stubborn confidence. But other times her eyes fill with blinding tears. Sometimes she responds to them with forceful courage. But other times... She struggles with tormenting fears that gnaw at the corners of her mind. But despite all of that turmoil, every time they ask, 
And every time she answers, when she can't respond to their needling questions, she can still respond with this. My love for my beloved and my faith in his promise remain unchanged. I don't care what you say or how you mock. He told me he's coming back to marry me and I believe what he said. Furthermore, I love him. They mock her mercilessly. What is thy beloved more than any other beloved, O thou fairest among women, what is thy beloved more than another beloved that thou dost so charge us? And you remember this. She says to them, my beloved is white and ruddy. He is the chiefest among 10,000. There's nobody in this whole country that can hold a candle to this shepherd boy that I fell in love with. And so it goes on day after day, week after week, month after month. Her shepherd her beloved is gone. It's like he left her behind to fend for herself. She doesn't know that he has a kingdom to run or a palace to occupy or laws to enact. She doesn't know any of that. In her mind, he's just the humble shepherd who came one day to the vineyard and they fell in love. She has no idea. And then one day, on an ordinary spring day, there was a great cloud of dust on the road and all the common people ran quickly to see what was going on. And soon they could make out a majestic procession. It was making its way up the dirt road straight to the vineyard and the murmurs of the crowd soon became excited shouts. It's King Solomon, the king is coming to our little village. The king is coming to our vineyard. And sure enough, Solomon himself was arriving on his glorious palanquin. That's a royal box carried by poles on the shoulders of his servants. And the Bible tells us that it was guarded by 60 of his soldiers and the Bible further says that there was so much incense being burned in honor of the king. It was like huge fragrant clouds, pillars of smoke winding their way out of the wilderness and entering the vineyard. Who is this? This is the question of the crowd. Who is this that cometh out of the wilderness like pillars of smoke, perfumed with myrrh and frankincense and with all the powders of the merchant? Behold his bed, his, his chariot, Behold his bed, which is Solomon's. Three score valiant men are about it of the valiant of Israel. They all hold swords. They're expert in war. Every man has his sword on his thigh because of the fear in the night. Nothing's gonna get to our king. Nothing can overturn the will of our king. Nothing can stop our king. Solomon made himself a chariot of the wood of Lebanon as they see this glorious, magnificent procession winding up the dirt road toward the little village of Shunem, they're excited because the king of the whole country has for some unknown reason decided to pay them a visit. No doubt, the Shulamites' abusive stepbrothers told her, you continue the work while we go and investigate this commotion. And they ran to see the royal spectacle, no doubt leaving her behind to continue her work and their work in the vineyard. After all, what would a king like Solomon ever want with a peasant girl? She doesn't have to be there. But then to the amazement of everybody in the crowd that day, King Solomon commands the chariot to stop and the king of the whole country steps out of the chariot. And then, to everyone's utter astonishment, he walks directly into the vineyard, directly past all the scraggly, scratchy vines, and he walks right over to the row of vines where the Shulamite girl is working, and he stops directly in front of her. 
No one in the crowd that day saw this coming. Nobody in the crowd that day can comprehend what in the world is going on. Maybe he's going to punish her. Maybe she stole something from the vineyard. All kinds of thoughts run through their mind. But the one thought that nobody thinks, the one idea that nobody has is that King Solomon could possibly be interested in a girl on her knees in rags. Imagine the Shulamite's shock and surprise when she looks up from her labors on that day to see the king of the whole country looking down at her. Maybe her instinctive reaction was one of fear or shame, knowing that he was gazing at a poor pauper peasant girl. But then she noticed something. She noticed the smile on his face. And she could hardly believe it, but she noticed the loving gaze in his eyes. And then something familiar crosses her mind. Memory goes to work. And she suddenly realizes that despite the royal robes and the crown and the entourage and the soldiers and the guards, she suddenly realizes what her heart could hardly dare dream. Her handsome shepherd has returned to marry her, but he's not just a humble shepherd. He's the king of the whole country, and he's come back for her. And he says to her, the fig tree putteth forth her green figs. It's springtime, and the vines with the tender grape give a good smell. And then he says to her, arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. I'm sorry for the emotion, but I've marinated in this all day. It fills my heart tonight because the humble shepherd that came the first time is coming back for his bride. And when he comes back, we won't see him as a humble shepherd this time. It will be the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Would you lift up your hands and in anticipation of that day, would you just thank him for the privilege of being loved by the king of kings? What a majestic honor. What a, a royal privilege we have. Ah. Uh, Mm. I worship you, God. I worship you, God. I worship you, Jesus. Oh, my. I know you feel this at home. Worship along with us. Jesus is here in this room right now. His royal presence is among us. And where the word of a king is, there's power. He's got the power to break any addiction. He's got the ability to shatter any depression. He's got the ability to lift you up out of your past and your failures. Where the word of a king is, there's power. Oh, Jesus. I thank you, God. I thank you, God. We've arranged, of course, because of restrictions for you to be seated in, in your bubble. Would you take the hand of somebody next to you in your bubble and would you lift that hand with theirs and would you just pray for a moment? Jesus is walking the aisles of this room. Jesus is touching hearts that are seated on these chairs. Jesus is among us. Jesus is for us. Jesus loves every one of us when he sees you. He doesn't see your failures he sees your future uh, he doesn't see your mistake that you made he sees the miracle he's going to make out of that mistake he's in love with you I worship you Jesus oh I thank you God It wouldn't even be right to keep on talking when the king has entered the room. We just need to worship him for a moment and then we'll continue. 
di torre della bossessa oh, 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 oh I thank you Jesus 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 oh I worship you Jesus King of all kings and Lord of all lords I worship you I worship you God I worship you God I worship you God in one instant her future changed forever because the king has come for her he gallantly escorts her to his royal chariot to the utter amazement of the crowd and then together he and she begin their royal journey back to the royal city of Jerusalem where she the pauper peasant girl will become Solomon's queen on that day in a split second when her world changed the vineyard was left behind her endless days of toil and suffering were history. Her persecutors, they can never touch her or taunt her again. Her rags are exchanged for royal garments. Her address instantly changes from a pauper's shack to a king's palace. And best of all, she gets to spend the rest of her life with her beloved the king who became a pauper so that a pauper could become a queen. And now the crowd that persecuted the Shulamite, they are absolutely astonished to see a peasant girl riding in the royal chariot of King Solomon, born by his servants and surrounded by 60 of his finest soldiers. And they are even more amazed to think that the mysterious, humble shepherd she always talked about was all the time the king of the entire country. When Solomon entered the vineyard, they had a question. Who is this? They still have the same question, but now there's two in the royal chariot. Who is this that cometh up from the wilderness? And she's leaning upon her beloved. Oh, what a day, glorious day that's going to be. And like every good romance, it ends this way. And they lived happily ever after. What a story. Because the story of the little eight chapter song of Solomon is actually the story of the entire Bible. From Genesis to Revelation. It's the story of the love of a king that refused to be denied to the point where he would robe himself in the rags of a pauper and come to this earth. But Jesus didn't disguise himself as a pauper. He became a pauper. He became flesh. He became everything that we were so that someday we could become like him. The world doesn't understand you people now. I, I get that. You know why they don't understand you? You know why they mock you? You know why there's so much criticism of Christianity in every kind of media today? Because they only see our Lord Jesus as a humble shepherd. And they have no idea that he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. 
they have no idea. To them, he's just an historical figure. To them, he's just maybe a good moral teacher, maybe a prophet of a religion, but for sure, he's dead and gone, and we can mock him and malign him all we want. They have no idea that he ever lives to make intercession for his church. They have no idea that he empowers his people by the power of the Holy Ghost, and they have no idea idea that soon and very soon the king is coming and the church will be caught up and this will all be over. They have no idea. And really, to be honest, neither do you and neither do I because we've never seen Jesus in his ultimate glory yet. We love him. We worship him, we serve him, we follow him. But eye has not seen nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things our God has prepared for them that love him. I know some of you were walking with Jesus before I was born and I honor you for your lifetime of service to him and your lifetime of love for his church and his kingdom. But even you, the senior, the esteemed among us, may I say humbly to you, you have no idea what this Jesus is going to be like when we finally see him in his glory. We read about him in the pages of the scripture, but our understanding is misty. It's like we're looking through a glass and seeing through a glass darkly. But one day we're going to see him face to face. And the scripture promises that when we see him, we will be like him. It's going to be an amazing, astounding day when Jesus comes. We've never seen him in his ultimate glory. He's the Nazarene. He's the Savior. He's our Messiah. He's our Lord. But although we have never seen him in his ultimate glory, in his eternal splendor, let me say to the devil and the world and anybody else that might be listening in, we love him anyway. We love him now before we see him then. We love him with all our heart now before our hearts are made new in heaven. We love him now. Peter, the Pentecost preacher, he said, Whom having not seen, you love. In whom though now you see him not, yet you're believing. And although you haven't gone to heaven yet, and although your feet have never touched streets of gold, and your eyes have never seen mansions and gates of pearl, walls of jasper, we still, right here, right now, before we see it all, we take it and accept it by faith, and we rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. We can get happy now about a heaven we've never seen. We can give thanks to God right now that we know where our loved ones are. We can give praise to Jesus because someday this is all going to be over. <laughs> There's an old song we used to sing years ago. It will be different the next time he comes. Just wait and see. On that day, when the king of all kings sets his foot into the world one more time, on that day, the world will see him and they will see us, the church, like they could never have imagined. It's not just Jesus who's going to show up in his glory that day. The church, the firstborn, the redeemed, the bride is going to be seen in all of her glory on that day when the king of all kings embraces her and brags to all of time and creation, this is my beloved bride. I gave my life for her. I shed my blood for her. She is mine. 
And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will receive you unto myself. And that where I am, there you may be also. My goodness. You feel that? That's the anticipation of a royal wedding. That's what that is. That's the anticipation of the day when the king keeps that promise that we've been waiting on, some of us for a few years now, but he's going to crack the sky and receive his people to himself. And in the meantime, we are simply waiting for the call of the king. My beloved spake and said unto me, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. That is what we are living for. That is what we are waiting for. That embodies all of our hopes and our dreams and our faith. It's as real as the chair you're seated on. It's as concrete as the pavement in the yard. It's a real hope from a real God for his people. And I love living here. And I love my family and all of you. But I can hardly wait for that day when Jesus returns because when he does trials of this life are over suffering is gone pain and a heartache it's history when Jesus returns I'm finished. Would you lift up your hands and everything that is in you and would you give a great praise to our magnificent bridegroom, the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords. There's nothing you're walking through that he doesn't know about and he's going to pay you back 10,000 times over in his heavenly kingdom. Oh, 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 join us at home. Lift up your praise to the King of Kings, to the Bridegroom, to the Lord of Lords, to our great God. Oh,